Good evening and thank you all for being here. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our OAH president, Earl Lewis, who is currently professor of history, professor of Afro-American and African studies, and the founding director of the Center for Social Solutions at the University of Michigan. Lewis earned his PhD at the University of Minnesota and began his teaching career in 1985 at the University of California at Berkeley. Four years later, he moved to the University of Michigan, where within a year he came to direct the Center for Afro-American and African Studies. Thereafter, his colleagues discovered his manifest talent for leadership and promoted him to Vice Provost and Dean of the Horace H. Rackham School of Graduate Studies. In 2004, Emory University lured him away to serve as Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and as the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of History and African American Studies. At that point, Lewis was on the road, in the fast lane really, to becoming a university president. But in 2012, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation invited him to work as president there instead. He served as president of the Mellon Foundation from 2013 to 2018, then returned to Michigan last year. Impressive as it is, this bare bones outline of Lewis's career only hints at his accomplishments. Earl Lewis is an eminent scholar of African American history. His high school classmates in Virginia already saw his mind in gear when they voted him the most intellectual member of his senior class. His first book, In Their Own Interests, Race, Class, and Power in 20th Century Norfolk, A Rich Social History, published in 1991, told us how African Americans in a southern city sought justice and empowerment in the home and community as well as the workplace. In the years since, Lewis has written dozens of articles and co-authored three books, including Love on Trial, An American Scandal in Black and White, a riveting tale of a 1920s interracial love affair that foundered publicly on the shoals of race and class. As an intellectual impresario, Lewis has co-edited numerous books, including the 11-volume Young Oxford History of African Americans and the award-winning text To Make Our World Anew, A History of African Americans. In addition, he was one of the founding co-editors of the prize-winning American Crossroads book series with the University of California Press. And as an academic mentor, he served on the dissertation committees of more than 30 lucky doctoral students. Lewis is a visionary with his eyes trained on the future as well as the past. At the Mellon Foundation, he reconfigured programs, implemented a strategic plan, and oversaw more than $1.2 billion in grants. He initiated and still co-edits a book series, Our Compelling Interests, that shows how diversity lies at the heart and soul of a healthy democracy. At Michigan, his new Center for Social Solutions focuses, as he puts it, on the critical issues of today, including the history of slavery and its ongoing legacies, the safe and just distribution of water, and the future of work and dignity of labor in the age of artificial intelligence. In recognition of his extraordinary career, Lewis has received nine honorary degrees. He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Council on Foreign Relations, the American Antiquarian Society, and the Society of American Historians. He served on the board of, among others, the Center for Research Libraries, the Educational Testing Service, and the American Council of Learned Societies. From 2010 to 2013, at the invitation of President Obama, he served as a member of the Department of Education's National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity. Lewis is a renowned leader in higher education, a distinguished scholar, a generous colleague and teacher, and an inspiring president of our organization.
At the OAH, she pushes us to look to the future, to ask what a professional organization should look like and what it might accomplish in the 21st century. History as he sees it is our civic duty. Tackling the history of race, he writes, is the only way to build a diverse, plural democracy, and collectively, that remains our shared responsibility. Indeed, it does. Please join me in thanking Earl Lewis for his wisdom, service, and scholarship, and please join me in welcoming him to the podium this afternoon. We're trying to find light. <laughs> well, this sort of helps. There we go. Thank you, Joanne. That was very, very kind and very gracious. I, at these moments, I always think of what my mother would have uh, felt like were she in the audience, and so she would have been happy. <laughs> And there are seats on the side here looking. It is an honor to be standing before you this evening. From my childhood in Virginia to my college and graduate years in Minnesota to teaching and administrative roles at UC Berkeley, Michigan, Emory, and Mellon, I have marveled at the grace, support, encouragement, and colleagueship I have encountered. Along the way, I found friends and mentors, co-authors and collaborators, some who started the journey with me are no longer alive. Yet every day, I carry with me the things they taught and the humor they spread. On this night, a special salute to my family, my wife Susan, my brother Rudy, my sister-in-law Rosalind. They have been with me through the days, good and bad. Their love I cherish and their support I value. Thank you, too, to the incredible staff of the Organization of American Historians, including the staff of the JAH. It is remarkable what they achieve each year and how they go about their roads with cheer, determination, fortitude, and just splendid resolve. I ask that they all stand so we can recognize and celebrate them. Similarly, I ask that the 2019 Program Committee and Local Arrangements Committee please stand and be saluted. Every president knows that while they may get the last word at an annual meeting, members of both of these committees deserve a great deal of credit for the outstanding gathering. Joe and Kate, Thank you for your leadership of the program committee. And Natanya, I truly appreciate all you did to welcome us here to Philadelphia. Finally, I want to thank my colleagues at the University of Michigan, the Department of History, the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, the College of Literature, Sciences, and the Arts, the Provost Office, the Office of the Vice President for Research, for their support and underwriting of aspects of this uh, annual meeting. Truly, thank you. Otto Kerner, Democratic governor of Illinois, represented the mainstream of American life when his name became associated in 1968 with one of the most more penetrating critiques of the nation's failure to adequately confront its troubled past. Kerner and colleagues have been assigned a task of understanding and explaining the nearly 200 urban eruptions labeled race riots that scarred the nation between 1964 and 1968 approximately 159 in 1967 alone. Racial antipathy and spasmodic violence has scarred the social landscape in fits and starts for centuries. From the 1741 uprising of enslaved people and poor whites in New York City through the 1967 rebellions in Detroit, frustration, anger, deprivation, and a yearning for some modicum of freedom periodically erupted, often with deadly consequences. Across space and time, lives have been lost, property destroyed, recriminations distributed, retribution sought, and reparations demanded. 
In each era in time, men and women of statue and status gathered to explain the events. In some years and in some places, they blamed the rebellious for everything. But by 1968, recent events had scarred, had seared the consciousness of a majority, so much so that they blamed the broader society. Who among us can forget the words of the Kerner Commission? And I quote, this is our basic conclusion. Our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. The words were at once powerful, indicting, critical, and insufficient. For a kid like myself, born in segregated Virginia, the authors of the report seemed to be telling history backward. We weren't moving toward two societies, one black and one white. That had been my reality since birth. That had been the conscious objective of a raft of stakeholders, a separate and unequal set of opportunities. When the telling of our stories is left to policymakers and politicians, a simplistic summary can elide reality, sliding into obfuscation and sometimes just lying. That's where historians matter most. Will we carefully and judiciously complicate the story by confronting the evidence before us? As we gather this Saturday evening in Philadelphia, where we have spent the last few days exploring the work of freedom, we're called once again to bear witness to the realities of two Americas, however and whenever we mark the origins. While Otto Kerner and his co-commissioners may have misidentified the birth of the two Americas, they succeeded in labeling its existence. In 1968, few could ignore the devastating effects of racism. The haunting images of a disfigured Emmett Till, scenes of beaten and bloody survivors, survivors of the firebombed interstate buses, harrowing images of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and the discovery of four murdered black girls, joined with newspaper and television accounts of an army of jail-bound, moderate foot soldiers who gave themselves and sometimes their lives for social justice. Each moment claimed a footnote a sentence, paragraph, chapter, or book in the larger story of the work of freedom. And as we have learned, it was not just the visible displays of oppression that shaped the past. More insidious aspects of subordination worked just as effectively as brutal expressions of violence. Some may say even more effectively. In a segregated world, even the most accomplished Afro African American learned lessons of self-doubt and self-loathing the imposter syndrome. The, Amer the African-American autobiographical literature is replete with comments about good hair and bad hair, loud clothing and proper dress. In those memoirs, you find repeated examples of the mantra, work twice as hard as a white counterpart to prove your worth. Elsewhere, black periodicals accepted the ads for skin whiteners and featured models that reflected colorism. Black social and fraternal orders took pains to exclude, often internalizing lessons from the broader social order. Of course, it would be reductionist to say racism was the only thing that mattered in the 60s. Racism's gnawing presence lived as powerfully and ubiquitously as, say, the Cold War. No American school kid who came of age by 1968 had any doubts about nuclear threats. At schools, we rehearsed what to do in case an attack came during the daytime hours. At the time, it even made sense to flee to the halls, crouch, and cover our heads. As if cinder block schools would offer some protection from the power of nuclear annihilation. Years later, I would laugh at this. Why was I in the hall covering up like this? But in those days, we had little room to confront the irony that as we hid from the supposed aggression of the rest of the world, only the United States had ever dropped nuclear bombs on others in war. And the imminent threats of racist violence and nuclear death stood next to other personal histories of human suffering. In 1968, some of us had family members who had survived the horrors of the Holocaust, or grandparents whose parents had been born into enslavement. It was a time when Native children had firsthand knowledge of what it meant to be torn from families and sent to boarding schools. And all around, we saw the effects of immigration quotas, which limited arrivals from all but a handful of places. 
50 years ago, where Americans reveled in a power to dominate the global landscape. War raged in Vietnam, notwithstanding acrimonious debate. At the same time, gas was cheap, cars were big, people were on the move, and to borrow from the temptations, the world seemed like a ball of confusion. Big business worked with big labor to stem crippling strikes, and the industrial order had not been pronounced dead. The AFL CIO carried exceptional clout, and a generation lasted 20 to 25 years rather than the digital generation's 18 months. Moreover, few foresaw today's questions about the rapid automation of work. Robots were things of fiction, whether Rosie on the, Jefferson, or on the Jetsons or some other version, and not ever-present helpers named Alexa or Siri. Thankfully, predecessor generations of historians inserted themselves into the era's public debates, sorting through the moment's facile assumptions to shape a longer vision of where the country had come from and where it might still go. We here today are the intellectual and professional heirs of John Hope Franklin, C. Van Woodward, Richard Hofstadter, Gerda Lerner, and many, many, many others who wrote broadly and openly about race, segregation, politics, gender, and more. Titles such as From Slavery to Freedom, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, and Black Women in White America informed all kinds of publics. In their own way, each represented an example of scholarship in the public eye. Franklin showed that American history was not complete without fully comp considering the African American experience. Woodward sought to explain the historical underpinnings of a Jim Crow or segregation, noting its human creation and implying we had the ability to oversee its autopsy. Hofstadter probed the inner world of xenophobic and racist thought and groups in the United States and began sketching them as homegrown expressions of worry and conceit rather than mere outliers. Lerner, meanwhile, showed in documentary detail the ways women, especially black women, left traces of their involvement in the making of America. Today, against the backdrop of mass shootings, hate-filled marches, and the attempted normalizing of the morally repugnant, the opportunity and importance of history and the common good, the man we plunge ahead and continue to grapple with society's greatest challenges. Thankfully, thankfully, many of you have accepted the intellectual baton and have already engaged this hard work from varying points of view. You've written about slavery, about racial ideology, war, the environment, and social justice. Your research has turned concern over the growth of the cultural state into a call to change the policies and practices of imprisonment. You've written about voting, labor, work, and politics. Your scholarship on social movements, gender, power, sexuality, religion, and a range of isms has forced us to ponder the boundaries of exclusion and inclusion. Some of you write op-eds, appear regularly on television, or have started nonprofits to advance the common good. Your scholarship reminds us that, building and that the building and nurturing of a democracy is work. To ensure we remain free to dissent, to participate, to vote, to criticize, to imagine a better tomorrow, requires work. The struggle to hear one another over the din of parallel echo chambers requires work. Turning our very diversity into an asset requires work. I want to spend the remainder of my time probing this last question. How do we continue to turn our diversity into an asset? Elsewhere I've written if demographers are correct and by 2044 this country boasts a non-white majority, we will need to embrace a new approach to diversity. Defining it is the first step. Valuing that diversity is next. And then we must leverage diversity for the benefit of all. This is no easy task and requires that we return to history and place the current moment and our shared future in context. It is the only way to fully confront the current thesis and limitations for rethinking the common good. That's not to deny the power of the black and white divide as a metaphor 
or disregard is harsh and at times lethal reality for scores. It is only to say as we go forward, we must also explain, expand the frame. We must also expand the frame. So where do we begin? Let's return to school. Education has been part of the ground zero in the battle over whose vision of America will prevail, whose sense of democracy would take hold. Education has long had a place at the table as we assess the work of freedom. And it's also a place where the work of diversity begins. A decade ago, I had the great pleasure of meeting one of the most wonderful people in the world, in my experience, Lucille Clifton. She was visiting Emory as a distinguished poet. We had a wonderful time talking. She revealed that her family had Virginia roots, as had mine. Well, Lucy Clifton died on February 13th, 2010, almost four, day, four years to the day of my own mother's death. Now, you may be asking, what does Lucille Clifton, a celebrated, celebrated poet, have to do with the theme of today's address? In word and action, she revealed the powerful beauty of the human imagination and served as continued proof that genius could be found in many places and in many figures. When Lucille was born in 1936, the country struggled through the travails of a severe economic recession we all know as the Great Depression. Segregation or Jim Crow prevailed also, de jure in the South and de facto many other places. Very few of America's leading universities would admit her or many other black kids, so she went to Howard University at age 16. In the early 1950s, Howard was the pinnacle of black intellectual life. Most of the nation's leading African-American intellectuals either taught at the Washington, D.C. institution, had taught there, or hoped to teach there. In the segregated world that was the 1950s and 1950s America, HBCUs such as Howard counted immensely. A college degree represented options beyond work as a day laborer or domestic. It offered kids such as Lucille the chance to dream that one day they could become poets, writers, scientists, inventors, even historians. And true to form, years later, she would become a college professor, a award-winning poet, and sharp and incisive observer of American life. I want to read and get this to work on time. Uh, and there we go. Uh, I want you to listen to just one of her poems. Uh, they're both fairly new. The first is called Aunt Jemima. It's in the voice of Aunt Jemima. White folks say I remind them of home. I, who have been homeless all my life, except for their kitchen cabinets. I, who have made the best of everything. Pancakes, batter for chicken, my life. The shelf on which I sit between the flour and cornmeal is thick with dreams. Oh, how I long for my own syrup rich as blood, my true nephews, my nieces, my kitchen, my family, my home. In the more than half a century since Lucille Clifton headed off to Washington, D.C. and to college, much in America has changed, as has aspects of race relations, especially. Closing in on 65 years ago, May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court tackled one of the most vexing issues in society, the question of whether black and white children should be allowed to attend the same schools. Now, bear in mind, this was more than a decade before the Kerner Commission talked about two Americas. Since the end of the Civil War, local municipalities had effectively segregated those of different races in schoolhouses across the South and much of the nation, as we know. When the court ruled in the 1896 Places decision, which had to do with seating on railroads as separate but equal, was supported by the Constitution, the legal apparatus for extending segregation had been constructed. 
for all to use. Then the Supreme Court ruled in 1954 and Chief Justice Earl Warren, the former governor of California, spoke for a unanimous body. And I think it's important at times to go back and listen to the words of the 54 decision for what they were saying and what they were suggesting. These cases came to us from the states of Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, and Delaware. They, they are premised on different facts and different local conditions, but a common legal question justifies their consideration together in this consolidated opinion. In each of the cases, minors of the Negro race, through their legal representatives, seek the aid of the courts in obtaining admission to the public schools of their community on a non-segregated basis. In each instance, they have been denied admission to schools attended by white children under laws requiring or permitting segregation according to race. The plaintiffs contend that segregated public schools are not equal and cannot be made equal, and that hence they are deprived of the equal protection of the laws. I go on, the court would say, today education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. It is required in the performance of all of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values and preparing him for later professional training and in helping him to adjust normally to, to his environment. In these, in these days, it is doubtful that any child may be reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it is a right, is a right which must be available to all on equal terms. And they will go on to conclude then that in this case, separate but equal was unconstitutional. And they would say, in fact, we conclude that in the field of public edu education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Now, many in this room know then the court will remand this to lower courts and it will come back a year later in what was known as Brown II. So a year later, the court issued its final ruling in the second Brown decision, instructing school districts to end the practice of segregation with all deliberate speed. One of the most curious phrases uh, in our legal history. I was one of thousands of young people born into segregated Virginia that year, 1955. All deliberate speed came to mean something very particular for my generation. From the time I entered public school in 1961 until 1970, I went to state-sanctioned racially segregated schools. All my classmates were black, and until I was in the eighth grade, so too were the teachers, except for Mrs. Estrada, a Filipina deemed too colored to be let loose in a predominantly white school. In the fall of 1971, my sophomore year, I entered the world of not integration, but desegregation. The school broke down this way, roughly 45% African American, 55% white. In it, Indian River High School in Chesapeake, Virginia, I gained a perspective on the Brown decision that we historians have mostly failed to stress in the books that we have written. Typically, this chapter is told as a case study in the search for equality, as a moment when the United States came to terms with the implication of what Nobel laureate Gunnar Myrdal labeled the American dilemma. But sitting in classrooms that 1971-72 academic year, I, wist, I witnessed something else happening. Brown was about equal opportunity for sure, but it was as much about the building of the diverse democracy and how we would go about it. Among my classmates, 
were the nieces and nephews of the wizards of the Ku Klux Klan. We knew this. My 10th grade geometry teacher regaled us with uh, stories of the good old days on the plantation. Notwithstanding the fact that half of the kids in her class were black and had a different notion of the good old days. All in this room know that the end of segregation was long, arduous, and at times violent. Most of the men and women who were privileged by the accident of birth that labeled them white rather than non-white clung to the old order. They had no desire to relinquish the advantages that race offered. But then the fight continued. The 64 Civil Rights Act, and a year later, the Voting Rights Act, wrote Voting Rights Act, and we began to have some momentum. And in many black communities, the way people f came to figure it is, well, 250 years of slavery, 100 years of segregation, and now, and now we would have our moment. Race had counted for all the wrong reasons for so long. Now it would count for the correct reasons. Policymakers couldn't avoid the inescapable. Nearly three, you know, three centuries of state-sanctioned subjugation demanded and required some kind of redress. But to avoid the call for reparations, government officials, beginning with LBJ, invoked instead the concept of affirmative action. Universities soon found themselves in response to student protests, societal pressures, and social understandings trying to respond and redress a national history of discrimination. And you think of it, it's a very short period, 1970 to 1978. Between those years, 70 to 78, universities expanded outreach programs to underserved communities, developed affirmative action programs to expand the number of black and brown students on campus, modified their curricular scope, introducing ethnic studies, African American and women's studies programs for the first time, and pledged to grow the numbers of students and faculty of color. Then in 1978, a much divided Supreme Court ruled that race could be weighted as only one of several factors in an admissions decision. And so after 16 years of opposition to Brown, massive resistance was one way that we usually summarize that period, interposition and, and all, but it was just basically subterfuge and, and delay. The states of the South finally complied, and in less than seven years, the courts took a giant step away from saying schools could remedy past histories of discrimination by taking race into account as a, as a primary or singular factor in the admissions decision. And many in this room know the case of UC Davis and the story of Davis deciding to set aside 10 seats in his medical school for African-American applicants. Although the University of California had no history of discrimination and UC Davis had no history, but they thought they were part of a society that needed to bring some redress and really struggle with the past. And they could advance then a whole range of other objectives. Alan Bakke, on the other hand, who had been trained as an engineer but sought to gain admission to medical school, believed he had been discriminated against because reserving those 10 seats, he imagined and his lawyers argued, was a form of racial discrimination. In a reasoned but convoluted decision, the late Justice Harry Blackman concluded that racial quotas were unconstitutional, but that race could be one of several characteristics that a university could factor into an admissions decision. The court further ruled that as one of several factors, it had to advance a greater desire for diversity, that is the institution, the university, rather than seek to remedy past histories of discrimination. So in an interesting kind of way, the court, the Supreme Court birthed the diversity argument in 1978 that we've been trying to address and deal with ever since. In so doing, we move from the current, the current commission's explicit focus on race to a legal remedy that ran from history. In effect, we privileged qualified colorblindness in a race-conscious world. Let's think about that. Qualified colorblindness in a race-conscious world. That is, race could be considered, but never as a standalone factor. <laughs> 
it almost wants you to argue the question, why only in higher education? Why is higher education special? At this stage, we enter the era of what I refer to as diversity 1.0. With each passing decade and each legal challenge, higher educational institutions came to employ different strategies and tactics to advance diversity. Students represented one opportunity and faculty and staff another. For one, students at the undergraduate level in particular turn over at a rate of about 25% per year, whereas annual faculty and staff turnover is in the single digits in most places. In a decade's time with concerted effort and diligent attention, one could begin to shift the student numbers. More assiduous work was, it came to be recognized was required to change the composition of the faculty and staff. Beginning in the 1970s and certainly by the early 1980s, selective colleges and universities where racial, ethnic, class, and gender diversity is far more pronounced, a far more pronounced problem than in other schools, introduced strategies to correct the seeming imbalances. They adopted high schools with sizable numbers of students of color, trying to compete for the best talent. They created summer bridge programs to help ease the transition from high school to college. They partnered with historically black colleges and universities, creating exchange programs. Some pioneered the use of undergraduate research opportunity programs, discovering along the way that students in such programs fared far better as measured by first year GPAs than students who had not participated in research opportunity in their freshman years. Some of these schools went to holistic reviews of credentials, recognizing that test scores and GPAs work at best as suggestive and not fully predictive about how well a student would do uh, in, as an undergrad and they had to be paired with teacher and counselor recommendations. And that included things about looking at the strength of curriculum, extra, extramural activities, and what now Angela Duckworth and others refer to as grit. Faculty diversification programs face greater challenges. In addition to lower annual turnover, the decentralized nature of faculty hiring could unearth a real tension between an administration's pledge to change the composition of the faculty within a specified period and the results. There was the enduring myth of the pipeline, and it shows up many times in the literature. That is, there were insufficient qualified candidates of color to compete for open positions. In 1980, African Americans claimed about 1,000 of the doctorates awarded in the United States. Asian Americans totaled 450, Latinx Americans 400, and Native Americans under 100. In other words, there were people uh, who were being produced in all these fields, but the numbers represent proportionally were small. In 1980, African Americans represented 4% of all recipients, Asian and Latinx Americans under 2%, and Native Americans less than 1%. And as we know, the production varied by areas of interest. We had an over-representation in humanities and social sciences, an even lower representation in the sciences and engineering. But there were candidates, even if there was more work to be done to grow the pool of available talent. During this period, local practices and attitudes proved as nagging a challenge as claims of a lack of talent. It was not uncommon for someone to proclaim in Region X, folks from that community won't want to live here. Or I asked my friend who is the best person in his or her lab and it wasn't any person of color. Too often, localized disciplinary based hiring and retention practices mitigated against successfully challenging assumptions and altering the numbers. In addition, in this period, early period of diversity 1.0, for too long, excellence and diversity were presented, were presented as competing and mutually exclusive ambitions. We were a generation away from scholars documenting the power of, the, of a diversity bonus and how in team settings and other places, the more complex the problem, the better results you get from assembling a truly diverse team of problem solvers. As at a number of schools, growth in faculty diversification followed both protest and an institutional agreement to curricular modifications. At the University of Michigan, for example, the first black action movement in the late 1960s and early 1970s 
led to the creation of the Center for Afro-American and African Studies. At the University of California, Berkeley, and San Francisco State, the third world student strikes played a role in the creation and the birth of both ethnic studies and African-American studies programs on campus. And as you will see, others soon followed with curricular change as a response to calls for altering the relationship between the academy and the surrounding communities, especially communities of color. Let's pause for a second. In those early years, it was a notion that each of these academic units had to have at least one foot, if not both feet, in their adjacent communities. They were not just representing themselves in the academy, they were representing and bringing things back to the community. During these early years, faculty had to be hired, credentialed, tenured, and promoted. At the same time, whole fields had to be both born and legitimized. Take, for example, the case of my former late colleague, Barbara Christian, the first black woman to earn tenure at the University of California at Berkeley in 1978, after arriving as an assistant professor in 1972. And many and some of you in this room know that Barbara pioneered the field of black women's literary criticism with the publication of her first book, Black Women Novelist, The Development of a Tradition, 1892 to 1976. Her work signaled that black women writers mattered and belonged in the canon. The critical acclaim that later was garnered by Toni Morrison and Alice Walker, Gloria Naylor, and others proved that black feminist criticism enriched the academy. But when in the story there, it doesn't tell you about all that went on. What goes unacknowledged today is the fight Barbara endured. Early on, some at the university questioned whether black women writers really did matter. Should we tenure someone who's writing about black women? Writers? Now, to know Barbara is to know she persisted. <laughs> In a world with a recognized canon, Barbara Christian's work altered boundaries shifted paradigms, and expanded fields of knowledge. In the process was born a symbiosis between the academic and the artist as each worked to alter the makeup of their understood body of knowledge. In fact, I can recall Alice Walker saying at one point in recognizing Barbara, I exist because you exist, and you exist because I exist. Your ability to say I'm worthy of critique and analysis gives me the legitimacy to go forth and publish more. There was this understanding and this interplay. But this required publishers willing to serve as outlets for the novelist and the critics. This required scholars prepared to revise syllabi and schools will, willing to build entire programs and departments. Building the architecture of an academic enterprise became key in the early years of Diversity 1.0. But most notably, Diversity 1.0 focused on the numbers. The strategy assumed that increasing the number of students, faculty, and staff would necessarily lead to a change in institutional culture. Fewer schools paid attention to diversity's best companion, inclusion. Or notice that the only interaction between diversity and inclusion, only by that interaction could one approximate anything called equity. For a school to be inclusive, it needed, in the language of President of Augsburg College in Minneapolis, Paul Primenal, to pivot from the hospitality framework to one of justice. He notes, and I quote, is hospitality enough? Is it just a fact of welcoming enough? Or is there a reason why the need to welcome demands more of us? That first generation of students of color who stay strikes, boycotts, and challenge their schools force a similar concern. A focus on inclusivity, they reason, means that I am not the only one who's supposed to change. If you look across the landscape, uh, particularly in the upper Midwest, there's a number of the small liberal arts colleges that brought in a sizable number of black students for the first time in the 1970s. They did so in talking to people with the expectation that the students would come and the students would change. The students would come there and they say, no, the institution needs to change too. It was that kind of contest as we came to understand. Social tumult 
shadow the era of diversity 1.0. Diversity naysayers continue to produce tomes alleging intellectual superiority along the racial color scheme, white on top, black on the bottom, and others arrayed along the spectrum. Political pundits and their watchers equated race conscious policies with reverse discrimination. Seemingly ignorant of the late NAACP leader Benjamin Hook's powerfully illustrative sports metaphor. Ben Hooks, during this period, would remind his audience that for years, runners in the 440-yard race lined up evenly until someone calculated that the person in the inside lane had to run a shorter distance than the person in the outside lane. Started in the same place, looked so equal. Only later did they go to staggered lanes, which had the appearance of inequality, but in fact assured a greater equity. Other supporters of this affirmative action responded in kind. Some would openly embrace what it meant to be an affirmative action baby. A few found new ways of interpreting the world with an eye on critical race theory, offering black bodies had long been marked as transgressive. If such markings came with new opportunities, such is the price of paying the struggle forward. A quarter of a century after Bakke, the U.S. Supreme Court heard another set of cases that further altered the diversity discussion in the United States, especially among higher education institutions. The Gruder and Gross cases pitted the University of Michigan against white applicants to its law school and undergraduate college. Well, those individuals alleged they had been denied admission solely because of the over-reliance on race by the school. In the end, the challengers didn't question the admissibility of non-white applicants. It was interesting, if you go back and look at, there was this whole notion early on about whether uh, these students, in the early generation, they were questioning whether students were qualified. But if you look at the lawyers for Gruden and Gratz, they came to argue, no, we know they're qualified. That's not an issue for us any longer. We just don't like race. We think race should be eliminated as a variable at all in a missions decision. Without going into all the detail, the court in the end upheld the use of race as one variable and extended the diversity logic first created in the Bakke decision. But Gruden and Gratz to me stands out for other reasons than, rather than the final conclusion. One, it was one of the first times really since the Brown decision that scholars were mobilized to provide the intellectual um, support for why diversity matters. And in fact, there was a time where you could actually click on the University of Michigan website and see all of the expert testimony of a whole generation of scholars who actually talked about how students learn and how they benefit from learning in a diverse setting. But more than that, it, the institution also dedicated resources to document all facets of diversity beyond just race, including holding symposia on, on and local, producing local videos on mental health and visible and invisible forms of disabilities. And it went so far as to make sure that the whole range of viewpoints were aired, creating spaces for the critics of its policies to also find a stage on campus to be in dialogue and debate with those who were in support. Now, some of we, many of you know the story, while the University of Michigan prevailed in the courts, it ultimately lost the right to use race or gender in its own decision making. Statewide referenda in California, Michigan, and elsewhere have placed additional limits on the use of race. But while Michigan and California may be forever locked or stuck in diversity 1.0 challenges, the courts have ruled that a school where a certain set of practices can go forward. And we began to see the sort of hints of a diversity 2.0 emerging. And this is all against the backdrop, right, of the last two weeks. As we've seen in recent headlines suggest, uh, there is a front door to admission. There is a back door to admission. And now we have something called the side door to admission. And it makes you think about then for those individuals who struggle to think through how do we actually get to where we need to be.
I raised this diversity part because we're about to see a profound change. By 2044, as I noted before, we're going to see a non-white majority in America, according to most dem demographers. Projections show a coastal phenomena with the majority of Americans living along the east, gulf, and west coast, and with much of that diversification occurring there as well. For some, this means that all we have to do is just wait. The numbers will take care of everything. But for those of us who are students of history, we realize change never happens because the numbers change. It requires a plan and a set of actions. And in fact, noting the current political uh, moment, others observe not only that the numbers should, will take care of everything, but they should not be confused with power, wealth, or political, or political control. And this is important for us. On some of our campuses then, new questions have emerged. With greater ferocity, students of color and their allies ask what it means to be included. Some students ask guarantees that strike their parents' generation as curious. They want names off of buildings to be sure, but they also want spaces protected, subjects added, and behaviors checked. Moreover, they grew up in a world far more complex than the current or black-white paradigm allows. Concepts of intersectionality jump from the assigned article in class to debates in the dorms to ways of defining oneself in relation to the others. Administrators experiment, experiment with cluster hiring to further enhance the diversity of faculty and staff. They offer incentives such as transitional postdocs to help take an attractive candidate off the labor market before their value and demand is more broadly known. In a few instances, they even support additional modifications to the curriculum, hoping to counter the evolutionary changes that come when faculty are free to simply reproduce themselves intergenerationally. Some institutions have formed consortial arrangements with either peers or unlike schools, seeking to match PhD candidates and graduates with faculty openings. All along, of course, macroeconomic forces continue to shift and reshape the contours of higher education and with it, the faculty. We can expect to see a more variegated sense of the faculty in the years ahead. Fewer, t fewer tenure lines, more clinical, or faculty of practice, more adjuncts and part-timers, more faculty equipped to teach in a digital format on a variety of platforms. We are at a moment of inflection. According to most recent reports that by 2030, upwards of 800 million jobs that had existed in 2015 will have disappeared worldwide. 54 million in the United States, one third of the contemporary American workforce. That macroeconomic change will have implications for higher education and how we think about diversity 1.0 and 2.0 or no or, or no uh, uh, on our various campuses. These questions then require us as historians to engage in the conversations. So in conclusion, racial and ethnic diversity is not a theoretical concept. All the demographic projections point to a non-white majority. And second, numbers are not destiny. Unless we carefully define what we mean by diversity that moves beyond the old binaries without running away from their hold on the American imagination, we will never be in a position to fully leverage diversity for the benefit of most. A leveraged understanding of diversity means we can explain that individuals may, as has been suggested, bond because they share similar backgrounds, perspectives, and views on the world but if that bonding is not also a, tied to bridging, the full effects of our social, racial, ethnic, religious, economic diversity will fail to be leveraged. Third, we can define diversity, we can leverage diversity, but we must still value it for it to make a difference. Through research and publications, joint programming and activities, policies and practices, we must understand its importance. At the OEH, we demonstrate that value through the wide and varied sessions we offer at each annual meeting. In the articles we publish in the Journal of American History, the ways we nurture and mentor younger scholars, the amplified initiative to share resources with teachers and other educators, and in our partnerships 
with media outlets, theater companies, museums, public media, and others. Even as we consider defining, leveraging, and valuing diversity, more than 50 years after the Kerner Report, we may ask if we have reached an inflection point. If Bakke signaled the shift from race to diversity in our accounting of American history, have events in the last two decades, from vigilante encounters and police shootings to armed confrontations between white supremacists and anti-fascists, have they foreshadowed a reset? As John Hope Franklin vividly recounted in his autobiography, Mirror to America, racism haunted him from his boyhood days in Tulsa through his college years in Nashville through an assortment of posts and assignments over a lifetime. Did it define him? No. Did it shape him? Yes. Perhaps no more than during his stint heading President Clinton's board on race, when journalists fashioned stories about him and the work of the board without fact-checking. Franklin would write, and if the energies of the hecklers on the sidelines could have been transformed into constructive support for the efforts of those who work to improve the racial climate, and if the media had been willing to give appropriate visibility to the board and its work, we might well have advanced the cause of racial relations even more than we did. Is this an error when race and our collective failure to address it? Is this an era when race stands poised to replace the diversity framework? I leave that question for all of us to ponder. Finally, as we look ahead and envision the OAH as an exemplar of a 21st century learning society, it must not only be diverse, inclusive, and equitable, it must make the case for history and the common good through scholarship, teaching, public engagements, documentaries, digital postings, media presentations, and hard work. We must never forget that what we do addresses the work of freedom. History teaches us our freedoms should not be taken for granted. They can be lost and rewon. I started tonight with the Kerner Commission. I want to end with another. As we look ahead, we may anticipate re-examining the words of the Truman Commission on Higher Education in 1947 and updating its conclusion. The first and most essential charge upon higher education is that it shall be the carrier of democratic values, ideals, and processes. Thank you. But don't leave yet, because I have a challenge to everyone in the room. So don't leave. I have a challenge I want to issue before you, before, you, before you leave. Thank you so much. So um, that was mentioned earlier of a, a longstanding member uh, who uh, passed away this year and made a generous gift to the OEH. And, and I was so taken uh, by this. Uh, so those of you who were not in the business uh, meeting, Robert Murray uh, was a member of the OAH for some 72 years, I believe, uh, is right? And he passed away, and in his uh, estate, uh, he left $50,000 to the OAH uh, as uh, a gift uh, for us to. So Kathy doesn't know I'm about to do this, but inspired by that, I will match his 50000 my family will match that $50,000. Uh, and um, and then issue a challenge to the organization that if others will add over the next five years so that we get to a total of $500,000, we will add another 50000 So that's a challenge to you. Thank you.